성경에 들어가사 성경을 읽으시려고 서심해 선지자 이사야의 글을 들이고늘 책을 펴서 이렇게 기록한 대를 찾으시니 곧 주의 성령이 내게 임하셨으니 이는 가난한 자에게 복음을 전하게 하시려고 내게 기름을 부시고 난을 보래사 포로된 자에게 자유를 눈먼 자에게 다시 보게 함을 전파하며 눌린 자를 자유케 하고 주의 은혜의 해를 전파하게 하려 하심이라 하였더라 어, 어. 책을 덮어 그 맡은 자에게 주시고 앉으시니 회당에 있는 자들이 다 주목하여 보더라 음, 이에 예수께서 저에게 말씀하시되 이 글이 오늘 나 너희, 너희 귀에 응하였느니라 하시니 저희가 다 그를 증거하고 그 입으로 나오는 바 은혜로운 말을 기이 여겨 가로되 이 사람이 요셉의 아들이 아니냐 예수님께서 저에게 이르시되 너희가 반드시 의원아 너를 곧 고치라 하는 속담을 인정하여 내게 말하기를 우리의 들은 바 가버나움에 생한 일을 내 고향 여기서도 행하게 하리라 하셨느니라 아멘 I got a little ahead of myself here. Um, before we before we read in English, let's go ahead and dismiss our our kids for Kids Church today. Let's pray for let's pray first. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for our children. Lord, thank you for the blessing that they are. And Lord, I pray as they as they go into Kids Church now to hear the gospel. Father, I pray that you would you would work in their hearts. Father, that they would uh, that they would hear your word, that they would understand it. And Father, that you would draw them to yourself, that they would trust in Jesus. Lord, they would live to know him and make him known. Father, thank you for our teachers as well. Lord, thank you for people that, that volunteer to come alongside and invest the gospel through their life into the, into the life of my child and the life of our children. Father, would you work in their hearts? Would you, would you produce faith in them to trust you as they teach? Not in their own ability to convince these children, but Father, in your ability to awaken their hearts. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for our children. Thank you for our teachers. And thank you most of all for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. As we've been studying through Advent together, our passage that we've read through, uh, that we heard preached together has been this. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. So we'll read that again today here in English. Verse 16 says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. May he be glorified in the reading and now in the preaching of his word. Uh, good morning. Uh, actually, uh, we like to have a manuscript for those whose first language is not English, but today we, our copier broke, so I posted it on uh, Facebook, so if you want to go to Facebook and follow along. Uh, this is the first time I actually typed out my whole manuscript word for word, but I doubt I'll follow that exactly. But <clears throat> uh, Today's title is Pay Attention to the Gospel. Pay Attention to the Gospel. And uh, the first part we'll talk about paying attention, and somebody was paying attention today. Actually, our Christmas service is not 4 o'clock, it's 4.30, so make a note of that. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks for <laughs> letting us know. I, was, I thought, I was wondering, 4, 4.30? But yeah, our Christmas service will be 4.30 p.m. on Christmas Day. So, um, so this is the uh, my section of the um, the sermon, this text, will be uh, Luke chapter 4, verses, oh, I think it's verse uh, 20 through 21. Um, and uh, I think this is the best part of the whole section myself, I don't know. <clears throat> but uh, um, actually, being a father is, is very difficult sometimes. Can I get an amen? <laughs> 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 I need to be a good observer. 
I need to be a good listener. I need lots of energy. I need lots of wisdom. And I need to be a good communicator. And actually, communication is not my, my strength. Um, <clears throat> I'm an engineer. I like to do mechanical, mechanical things and, to, and uh, math problems and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, as an engineer, I do need to write reports. So that's my weakness. But as a, to be a good father, I, I need to be a good communicator. And not only that, but that's not all. My daughters need to be good listeners. They need to listen to what I say as I give them instruction on how to do something. They need to listen and pay attention. They need to listen so that they can mature, become mature and, uh, and grow up well and learn how to, to live life and someday become independent. Though I pray that never. They stay at home as long as they want. <clears throat> and <laughs> yes, but yeah, I know someday they will become mature and then get married and move out. And also, they need to be, they need to pay attention and listen yeah, for their own safety, especially during these young ages. I tell them, oh, don't touch that, it's hot, or don't walk over there, it's dangerous. There's cars on the street, hold my hand. So uh, I need to be a good communicator, but they need to pay attention to what the Father says. Yeah, if they don't pay attention, sometimes there's bad news for them, right? So, uh, this, <clears throat> uh, this same principle can be seen in our text today. We see that it is important to focus and to put forth effort to listen to the Heavenly Father's words we see in the text. Uh, because knowledge of Himself, His instructions, and the Gospel are conveyed through words. And with the proclamation of the gospel, people are confronted with the decision to believe or not. In the same way, we need to focus when God speaks because he holds us responsible for what he has directly told us in his revealed word. We are responsible with the gospel ourselves to believe it, and we are responsible uh, with the gospel to proclaim it. So let's look at the, the text for today, uh, Luke um, chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. It says, And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I just, I just wonder what Jesus felt like when he read the scripture and then sat down. <laughs> but actually, at first I thought, that's really strange. Why does he read the scripture and then sit down? I mean, isn't he going to teach standing up? But, yeah, actually, uh, it was his custom to sit down, and the custom at that time to sit down after reading the scripture, to sit down and to teach sitting down. We see that he sat down when he goes up on the mountain in, in Matthew chapter 5. He sat down and gave the Sermon on the Mount. And we see whenever he went out, he was getting crowded. He got in the boat and went out. He sat down in the boat and then taught the multitudes at that time. We see him uh, sit down in the temple in John chapter 8. And then in Matthew uh, 26, 55, it says, Day after the day, he sat in the temple teaching. So this is uh, not anything strange for them, though it would be a little strange for me, as you just thought. Um, so what was, what was interesting was the next part of the verse, and uh, this is what I want to talk a little bit about. The next part of verse 20 says, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. The verb used here means to stretch or strain, to fully be occupied with to keep one's eyes intensely focused on. So it means having their full attention and expectation to be fascinated with something. Luke 19, uh, 48 says that the people were hanging on his words. They were hungry, expecting to hear the word of God preached by Jesus. They were not looking at their watches. 
They were not bothered by cell phone notifications. They were not thinking about what is for lunch or what's going on next week or my plans for Christmas. They were focused on the Word of God and what was going to be uh, spoken by Jesus. Their eyes were fixed upon him, hanging on every word, waiting to hear the Word of God explained, waiting to be filled with spiritual sustenance, waiting to hear life-giving words, words of hope, words of God's faithfulness, words of God's love for them, words indicating that God has not forgotten them or his promises to them of a Savior and redemption to come. They were waiting to be satisfied with God's word, to have that fulfillment. They didn't have their Bible on their smartphones. They didn't have YouTube or the internet or millions of sermons online that they can go to easily. In fact, most people didn't have the word of God at home. They had to meet at the synagogue to hear the word of God, and it was very precious. This time was precious. They can hear the word of God. That's why a lot of the people back then, they had to memorize the word of God to keep it with them. How often do we approach God's word with the same expectation? How often do we expect to hear from God, hear him speak into our lives? How often do we long to glean the riches from the word of God being spoken? Do you have that same desire every morning or every evening as you dig into his word? My life is full of distractions. And sometimes I think maybe I have ADD. From back and forth to different things. But but I like to say that, uh, yeah, I'm good at multitasking. That's what I'm doing. (laughs) But I can, I'm tempted to say, oh yes, I can listen to God's word as I'm, Uh, looking at my uh, Facebook post or some other app or doing something else as I'm listening to God's Word. But uh, I think we need to be very careful. That's very dangerous. We can miss what God is trying to say to us if we don't give Him our full attention when we open His Word or listen to His Word being preached or on on the audio version of of the Word. We need to train our, ourselves to focus on the Word of God with intentionality. Uh, we take His Word for granted. I think sometimes we don't consider it very precious. I have maybe a hundred different versions of the Bible on my phone. I can pull it out anytime I want to and, and look even several, maybe a hundred different uh, languages of the Bible on my phone. But uh, we can see how precious the Word of God is was to the Jews, considering the way that they properly uh, handle the Torah, or the scroll of the Bible at that time. And there are some rules that they have to abide by, and one of them is uh, they need to keep the Torah in a special place. There's a cabinet that they kept the Torah in. And it should always be uh, upward, and when they carry it, resting on the right shoulder. And... People must rise and remain standing in the presence of the Torah. The Torah should be held by a person and not be placed on a seat uh, in your car when you're transporting or don't just throw it in the trunk. No, the, the Torah may never be placed on the ground. That's, you don't do that. And no other item should be placed on top of the Torah. Uh, a Torah should always be placed upright, never upside down or face down. So the Jews had all these kind of rules for the Torah because the Word of God was precious to them. How precious is it to us? I think some, most of us have five Bibles at home. Who knows? And they're on the shelves and stacked under lots of other things. And I think it's great that we have lots of Bibles. But I just want us to consider the Word of God precious. If this is the way that God's chosen people treated the Torah, how much more should we treat the complete revelation of who God is? This is God's word. I'm not saying we should follow these rules for the Bible, uh, but I do think that we have forgotten how precious God's word is. And we need to intensely focus and pay attention when you read it at home and when it's read in church and consider God's word precious. So we can see that, uh, that those who were listening to Jesus, they loved God's word, and they knew they were responsible for what was written in God's word. 
and they knew they were responsible for what it meant. So they fixed their eyes on Jesus and waited for him to explain the meaning of the, of the section he just read. Just like with my daughters, my daughters had better pay attention when I speak. And we too need to pay attention to what the Heavenly Father is saying through his word. It, is, uh, it has eternal significance for us, but not only us, for the people around us. So let's look at the next verse. Verse 21. Uh, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So in, his, in Isaiah, uh, Jesus read a couple of lines, and remember there are no chapters or verses back then. Uh, and then he sat down and said one sentence, and it was finished, and then everybody went to lunch. Sounds great. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking, don't get too excited yet. It says, he began to speak. So not just a one word, a one sentence sermon, but it says he began to say to them. Luke picked out the one sentence that, was, that captured the meaning of the whole a message that he spoke. And theologians agree that Jesus said more than just one sentence here. So let's continue to look at this one sentence that Luke thought was the theme of his whole sermon. Let's look at what it says. It says, uh, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So let's begin with the first word, today. And I think this sentence kind of summarizes what the gospel is. So that's, that's what I want to uh, share with you today. Where is the gospel in this one sentence that Jesus shared? It says, Today. Today is not a now and only now uh, word in this sentence. It's a timeless now. Uh, we see several places in Scripture. For example, in Hebrews 3.15 it says, As it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Today. This today is also for us today. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable, favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's this now that he's talking about. The now is now for us, it was now for them, it's now for whoever reads this at that time. So, with the word today, we notice. This is a timeless now, meaning uh, today is today for us too. Now let's look at the next words in the verse. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture, let's focus on that part right now. It says, uh, what he said, <clears throat> let's look at what he said. Uh, we've heard this over the past few weeks, so I don't need to spend too much time on this, but let's, uh, let me move through this and kind of give you a review of what we've talked about. So first, Jesus was sent with the authority and mission of God, empowered and driven by the Holy Spirit. So what was this mission? And it explains the next part. Jesus came to proclaim good news to the poor. Why to the poor? But only the poor can enter the kingdom of heaven? <clears throat> well, the poor in spirit, that is correct. But the poor are aware of their need. A theologian says that their uh, material uh, deprivation often translates into spiritual sensitivity, humility, and responsiveness to God's message of hope. And spiritually speaking, we are all completely and utterly bankrupt without Jesus. Next, Jesus came to set the captives free. The sinner is captive by his sin, right? You cannot stop sinning. The sinner cannot stop sinning. Romans 6 says that we were slaves to sin, unable to free ourselves, bound forever, without hope. Jesus came to set free the sinner from the power of sin and death. And then next, Jesus came to recover the sight of the blind. Before one meets Jesus, he's blinded by unbelief. Yeah, we do not believe uh, in Jesus, the God, and the gospel. Here in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, 
In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus has come so that the sinner may see the gospel of the glory of Christ. Next, Jesus came to liberate those oppressed by Satan. Oppression is a abuse, a prolonged, cruel, unjust treatment or control. The unbeliever is under the power of Satan. And Jesus has come to liberate those under the power of Satan. Then Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is an era of clearer expression and knowledge of Jesus and God's plan to save his people from righteous judgment. We are still part of the era today. An interesting thing is what Jesus didn't say. In the next part in Isaiah's text, uh, Jesus didn't say the day of vengeance of our God. The day of vengeance. This has not yet happened yet, but God will judge the world. Notice the words, the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. God has given us a longer time period, extended favor for a long time, but the day of vengeance is coming, and it will be short and swift. Let's take advantage of the year of the Lord's favor while we are still here in that time. So what does the scripture represent? So we see that we have the oppressed, uh, the captive, the poor, and this represents the rescue of hopeless humanity. These are hopeless situations. When you're oppressed, when you're slaves, what can you do? You can't do anything. When you're ca captive, you can't free yourself, right? What can you do when you're oppressed and people are controlling you and your situation? Uh, you can't escape these situations. These are hopeless situations that Jesus has come to proclaim the rescue. So first we have today and then this scripture. Let's look at the next words in this sentence. It says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Has been. This is the perfect tense, meaning that it started in the past and it continues in the present. Here together with the word today, uh, it is much like the present tense or this scripture is being fulfilled today. It has been and continues to be fulfilled. Then we have uh, the next part. So, so the words has been means that something has started in the past and continues and has been fulfilled. What has been fulfilled? Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. We can see the Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in Jesus and His work on the cross throughout the Gospels, as well as the words of Jesus here in this text being fulfilled. Just a few chapters later, messengers of John the Baptist come to Jesus asking, Are you the one, or should we wait for another? That story is in Luke chapter, 21, uh, chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And Jesus says, go, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of Scripture. I am the hope for the hopeless. In your most dire situation, I am your Savior. I am your Redeemer. Humanity is in a desperate situation. In its poverty, its captivity, its blindness, its oppression, and humanity is unable to help itself. Without the gospel, we are heading toward death and destruction. So the word fulfilled here means something is complete. And in this context, is complete apart from what we do because of what Jesus does. So we had nothing to do with this being complete, but it's all about the work of Jesus Christ. And let's look at the final words in this section. It says, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In your hearing. Jesus does not say within your sight. Is that interesting? 
I mean, he's talking about these physical things, we think. Our first thought is this physical things, right? But, he says, within your hearing, these things are being fulfilled. It would seem if he were talking about the physical liberation of captives, or it would be something seen and not heard, right? If he were healing the physical side of the blind, it would be something seen and not heard. If he were freeing physically oppressed people, it would be something seen and not heard. So why does it say, in your hearing? Though Jesus did many miracles, there's no doubt about that. He healed the blind. He freed the adulteress who's about to be uh, stoned to death. Right? And he's talking about here spiritual poverty. He's talking about spiritual captivity. He's talking about spiritual blindness. He's talking about spiritual oppression. How are the spiritually poor made rich? How are the spiritual captives and oppressed set free? How are the spiritual blind able to see? By faith in Jesus Christ. And how does he give that faith? By hearing. Not just physical hearing, but spiritual hearing. And where does that come from? It comes through the word of Christ. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Now we can see why Jesus says, In your hearing is fulfilled has been fulfilled in your hearing. I think it's interesting that faith doesn't come from seeing miracles. Though many people today say, oh, if I just saw a miracle, I would believe. Right? Faith doesn't come from seeing miracles. The gospel is not miracles. The gospel is not physical sight. Nor is it a result of being able to walk. Even walking on water. In this story about the rich man, uh, in a story about the rich man and, and Lazarus, uh, the rich man wants to send Lazarus back uh, to his brothers, right? Back from the dead to, his br to warn his brothers of hell. But Abraham says, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Moses and the prophets are more powerful than miracles. Why? Because the gospel is explained through them. The gospel is in the law and the prophets? Yes. They talk about Jesus and what he would fulfill. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus himself is talking with two men who are a little bit confused about what happened. They thought Jesus was the one, but he died on the cross. We can pick it up in Luke chapter, 27, verse, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 27. It says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It is the hearing of gospel that is needed, not miracles. That is why we see the religious leaders doubting right after miracles are performed. It is the word of Christ and the faith he gives that brings salvation, not miracles. The gospel is the power of God, though miracles are the power of God too, but for us, for those who believe, as it says in Romans chapter 1, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is not setting free physically captive and the physically oppressed. The gospel is setting free spiritually captive and spiritually oppressed. The gospel is that Jesus, the Son of God, came to the earth to live a perfect life so that he may be able to appease the infinite wrath of a perfect and holy God that was directed to humanity. Now those who believe and trust the sacrifice of Jesus can be forgiven and reconciled back to God. So we see in the words, in your hearing, this is the rescue of humanity that is proclaimed in words. It is not a physical thing, but it is a spiritual thing. So when we put this all together, what do we have? It says, Now, the rescue of hopeless humanity, which started in the past and continues, is complete apart from us, but through Jesus Christ, which is, this rescue is a spiritual thing, and it is conveyed by words. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we conclude, 
this part, I hope you see that this prophecy is being fulfilled. The living Word of God is still proclaiming the good news to the spiritually poor. It is proclaiming the good news to set the captives free and to open the unbelieving eyes. And this is still the year of the Lord's favor. So now in our hearing also, the word of Christ is proclaimed and a decision is to be made. With hearing comes responsibility for a decision. A decision to believe or not believe. When I tell my daughter something, they are responsible for that information. Oh, there she is now. <laughs> uh, they are held responsible for what they are told and what they know. In the same way, God holds us responsible for what we are told and what is revealed in his word. Jesus is the fulfillment of scripture, which is the rescue of humanity. This is the gospel. We are responsible for the gospel ourselves and with the gospel to take it to others since we are the body of Christ. And now it is in your hearing. What are you going to do? And what is our response to be? Let's look at some applications I have drawn from this text. So first, come to the Word of God with attention, with your full attention and with expectation for God to speak to you. God speaks and His words bring life. We don't live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need to read His word with anticipation. We need to listen to His word, expecting God to say something to us. Don't be distracted by the things of this world, by the worries of tomorrow. Give all of your attention to Him. Now, can we do this? <coughs> Should we struggle with all of our might and all of our will to focus on God's word? It's impossible. I've tried it. We come to Him like we do in all other situations. God, I can't do this on my own. I can't do it. Give me strength to focus. Give me passion for your word. Let me see how important and precious your word is. Because I don't understand and I don't have the strength. I don't have the will to do it on my own. Let us come to the word of God with, with attention, with expectation, and with passion. Let us ask him to give us that for his word. Number two. For those who are poor, for those who are captives and blind and oppressed, repent. This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is your chance to turn to Him. How do I explain to the blind man what sight is? I can't. How can I explain liberty to one who has never been free, who's always been captive? I can't explain it very well can I? How do I explain freedom to one who has always been under the control of another? Uh, I can't do it. But the Holy Spirit can do it. And as we proclaim the gospel, the Holy Spirit can work in those people's lives. And I, I think the Holy Spirit is working today in your hearts right now. So today, if you don't know, if you never put your trust in Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that today. I believe He is speaking to you now. Today is the day of salvation. Today you can be born again. A spiritual birth. You can experience new life by believing Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He came to die instead of you. To take the punishment of your sins. So turn to Him as your Savior. Repent and believe today. Number three. For those of you who were poor, who were captive and blind and oppressed, Remember and rejoice. We are no longer blind. We are no longer captive. We are no longer oppressed. We're, we've been set free. Let us rejoice and praise God. Let's thank Him. In the day of the Lord's, in the, in the year of the Lord's favor, the era of the Lord's favor, we have ex uh, escaped the terrible vengeance to come. When you were desperate, he came down and saved you at the right time. Let us rejoice. We all have difficulties in life and wonder 
what God is doing at times and maybe even have times of depression. But it's not hell. We should rejoice in all circumstances because God has saved us. Let us remember and rejoice. Then number four, for those who were poor, once again, and were captives, were blind, and were oppressed, follow the example of Jesus. We also have the Holy Spirit. And we are the body of Christ. As Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, He has called His church to continue His work, to continue His mission. Proclaim the gospel. But that is not all. Jesus reached out graciously and helped people in their physical need. He helped the poor, freed the captives, helped the blind, freed the oppressed. That is our mission too. Of course, we proclaim the gospel and then we also work this out in our physical lives too. John 20, 21 says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. We are to continue the spiritual and the physical ministry of Jesus until He returns. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank You for Your Word and, and we confess that, that there are times and maybe many times that we have not focused on Your Word as we should have. We have not considered it precious as we should have. Lord, we ask that you give us passion for your word. Lord, that we may listen to your words, that we may receive instruction, that we may become mature. Lord, I am weak and, and my will is weak. I want to pay attention to your word like you want me to. And Lord, as we... I think about those around us who may not know you, Father. I just pray that, uh, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel, but we would proclaim the gospel as we see in the mission of Jesus Christ. And let us go on and complete the mission of proclaiming the gospel and also helping those who are in need, those who are in desperate situations. Let us be good examples of you. Lord, I just come before you and, and I know that we can't do this on our own and we just ask that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit and guide us and direct us, Lord. May we surrender ourselves to you. May we be sensitive to your Holy Spirit when you speak, Lord. May we delve into the Word and glean the riches from it daily. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.